but we meet every Monday from 12 to 1.30 in this room. Um, and we have a website where you can actually look at all of the speakers, which I'm pretty sure everyone in this room is probably already familiar with, but it's um, beth.ucla.edu, and you can link to the seminar series from there. And the um, complete list for fall quarter is up already, so um, please give that a look. The sponsors for this year are the Center for Society and Genetics, the Department of Anthropology here at UCLA, the Division of Social Sciences, the Coatsen Institute of Archaeology, and newly this year, the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. So we're happy to have all of them backing us. And next week's talk um, is Uri Kneezy from um, the University of California at San Diego School of Management, and he's going to be talking about gender differences in preferences. And this week, we have Aaron Blackwell from the University of California, Santa Barbara, and he's going to be talking about life history, immune function, and helmets, which I know nothing about. So if you don't know that word, but you're in good company. <laughs> Okay, can you hear me, Leo? Yes. Yeah, good. Okay, so yeah, I'm going to talk about life history, immune function, helmets, uh, and some work among the, the Schwar, or a group in Ecuador, that uh, probably most of you are familiar with, since Clark works there too. So, here we go. I just want to start out uh, talking about life history theory a little bit. Um, and really talk about life history theory just as a reformulation of the first law of thermodynamics that energy can neither be created nor destroyed, it can only change forms. And so as a consequence of this, organisms have limited energy budgets and have to decide how to use the energy that they do have. And so typically life history theory split the energy that an organism has that it can use for competing demands into you know, broad categories such as growth, reproduction, and maintenance. And, um, but of course, these are just sort of general sorts of categories. Uh, we can think about organisms and the competing demands they have for the, for the energy that they have uh, as being a little more complicated than that. And each of these categories we can split up into, into multiple different sorts of things. So this is our simplified schematic of life history trade-offs. Uh, let's just take away that stuff for now. Um, and here's our, our energy. Organism has energy. You can put that energy into to growing larger. You can put it into reproducing. You can put it into, into maintenance. And by maintenance, talk about maintenance as being things like uh, immune function or repair of injury. So reproduction, things like producing offspring, caring for offspring, uh, investing in offspring, acquiring mates. Growth and development. This, this can be broken up further, you know, you might want to invest your energy into growing taller, or you might want to invest your energy into storing fat for, for future needs, um, or you might want to invest it in growing a big brain or things like that. So there are going to be trade-offs even within this category of growth. And maintenance, broadly, we can talk about repair and defense. Um, repair being repair of damage caused by pathogens or injuries, things like that. And then one thing I want to talk about today uh, is this category of the immune defense. And even within immune defense, thinking about the uh, defense against pathogens, uh, we can break immune defense itself down into the different categories. we talk about different types of defenses that organisms have in their immune system. Um, and broadly, again, we can think of these as nonspecific kinds of defenses. These are generic sorts of things that an organism might use for, uh, for any sort of thing. Um, Cell-mediated defenses based on uh, cells, macrophages that will roam around and, and eat other pathogens and things like that. And what we might call humoral defenses, which are uh, antibodies that circulate in the blood that'll, that'll bind to things. So when you get a vaccine, for example, that is going to ultimately generate uh, an antibody that, that remains in your blood that is, has been selected basically through a process to to bind to a particular type of pathogen and protect you against it. Uh, and you can break these down even further and talk about, so nonspecific defenses, you've got things like uh, acute phase responses. Um, this is things like fever. Um, complement, which is a process that, that basically binds to a pathogen. Um, and humoral defenses, you've got different types of antibodies that circulate in the blood. And these are, these are known as immunoglobulins. So. 
Okay, so some of the things I want to look at today are just sort of broadly um, looking at our total energy here and looking at just a few of these trade-offs between these different pathways. So first of all, look at trade-offs between immune function and growth. Um, and this is just sort of the broad question, and I'll get more specific of what I, what I mean by that and what I'm actually going to measure. Um, and so we might predict that controlling for total energy, increased investment in immune function would be associated with poor growth because of this trade-off in energy allocation. Um, so we know that mounting an immune response decreases growth, decreases survival, and decreases reproduction across species. Uh, studies in lizards and birds, you can do this experimentally. Um, and in humans, we know that periods of, of illness result in growth delay, result in stunting. Um, but you might think of this more broadly in terms of if you're, an or if you're, if you're living in a pathogenic environment, you might want to preemptively allocate your energy into defense or into growth based on cues in that environment about, about what, how, um, how likely it is that you're going to be infected with something from that environment. So there might be some sort of also preemptive shifting of energy based on exposure. So that's one of the things I want to talk about and look at. Okay, and then uh, another thing we wanna, I'm going to look at here are trade-offs between there we go uh, between different branches of immune function and so rather than just looking at, at one sort of immune response look at a, a couple of them at least while we're looking at this and um, obviously there are dozens of different things if more than that that we could look at I'm just going to look at two uh, immunoglobulin E and I'll talk about what that is and uh, a marker of acute phase response known as C-reactive protein. Uh, and, and look at trade-offs then between these different branches of immune function. So um, again, given, li given limited energy, organisms may want to allocate their energy between these different types of defenses depending on what they're exposed to. So different types of immune responses and these different types of immune responses have different costs and benefits. So these nonspecific defenses, uh, you could, like inflammation, so this is, if you think of this like when you get a fever, that's a pretty nonspecific defense. You're increasing the temperature of your body. Um, so the benefits of these kinds of nonspecific responses are that they're fast to respond. You just turn them on basically in response to to having a pathogen in your body. Um, and they can be relatively brief in duration. And compared to some of the more specific defenses where you may be maintaining a defense over years in order to um, be prepared, basically. Um, but there's some cost to these kinds of specific defenses. So one is there's high term, high short term energetic costs. Uh, again, mounting a fever, that uses a lot of calories. Up in a short period of time. There's also, and this is probably more important cost, is that nonspecific defenses have high collateral damage. And um, so if you're a longer lived organism, you might be more concerned about the damage you're doing to yourself by these kinds of broad defenses. Uh, so inflammation, for example, is associated with things like damage to your arteries that may lead to earlier senescence or or other sorts of things, or it's going to require more energy to be put into repair to repair the collateral damage caused by your own defenses. Um, and these kinds of nonspecific defenses may also be less effective than a defense that's more specifically targeted toward, toward a particular pathogen. Okay, and then our, our specific defenses, thinking of things like humoral immunity, so is that generating antibodies to a particular type of pathogen that's going to be specific to that particular pathogen and protect against that specific pathogen. So the benefits of, of having a defense that's really specific against something is that it's probably going to be more effective because it's, it's targeted specifically towards that, that, that threat. Um, and so part of that, because of that specificity, you're going to have lower collateral damage because it's not going to attack your own cells in effect. It's not going to cause damage to your own cells like uh, something that's more general might. And uh, if you maintain these kinds of specific defenses, you might be less likely to get sick in the first place. So 
and use the example of a vaccine again, if you've, if you've been um, inoculated with a vaccine, you generate the antibodies to that vaccine. And so you're not going to get that disease in the first place because you've already got defenses against it that, that you keep around. Um, but the cost of specific defenses, one, if you haven't been exposed to that pathogen, you may not have that specific defense. And it may take several days to mount a specific defense if you are newly exposed to something. It can take a few weeks to generate an antibody response. Um, and, and if you're going to keep these standing forces around, there may be long-term costs to maintaining that. So if you're, if you're maintaining within your body, say, uh, antibodies to a number of different pathogens, well, that cost may add up over time if you're, if you're maintaining that. So specific defenses are a little like hiring a full-time security guard. The non-specific are more like waiting for something to happen and then calling in the SWAT team and with, with their hand grenades and things like that. So, so non-specific defenses, if you think about different organisms, non-specific defenses should be preferred for organisms that are in a hurry, they have maybe high risk of dying of other things. They don't want to wait two weeks to generate uh, generate a specific response. Or organisms that have a short lifespan may not be too concerned about collateral damage uh, because they don't have the long lifespan. So there's not enough time for a lot of collateral damage to build up over time. Whereas if you're a long-lived organism, you may be more concerned about uh, limiting collateral damage. You might not want to do as much damage to yourself if you expect your body to need to live for a while. Um, you might want to use nonspecific defenses too if you're just not exposed to disease very often. So it wouldn't make sense to hire a full-time security guard if there's really not much of a threat. You know, it's not going to pay off. Um, specific defenses then would be preferred in, in these longer-lived organisms or in organisms that have an abundance of energy, and so they're not as limited in terms of maintaining specific defenses to lots of things. Or in organisms, you might think, if, if you're repeatedly exposed to the same type of pathogen, you might want to um, maintain defenses against that pathogen and just keep them on hand. So. Okay. Oops. So back to this. Um, the things we're going to look at again, uh, more specifically, I'm going to look at growth, which is primarily in terms of height and weight. Um, also, some, some measures of uh, skin fold thickness to measure fat, fat measure energy stores, uh, immunoglobulin E, and C-reactive protein. So let me just talk about immunoglobulin E first. And to talk about that, I have to introduce these guys. The helminths. So helminths are just uh, intestinal worms. Um, and they infect a huge number of people, over a billion people worldwide. So some of the most common are roundworm, Ascaris, uh, hookworm, whipworm, and threadworm. So these are, these are four of the most common types of helminths that infect people. And generally, these guys look pretty nasty, but uh, they don't seem to have a lot of obvious health consequences. So if you have a high helminth burden, you, um, you get infected. It's associated with anemia and to some extent poor growth. But in general, these are often overlooked because they don't have really dramatic sorts of health consequences. Um, not like malaria, which it's obvious you have malaria, you get high fever. So, yeah. the same ones dogs have? So the, the ones dogs have are slightly different species. There's, um, I mean, similar yeah, yeah, similar categories. And like dog hookworm can infect people, but it doesn't complete the life cycle, I think. And so there's not a whole lot of back and forth, but with dogs specifically. Um, helmets are interesting. One reason they're interesting is because even though they look like they're not doing a whole lot, they're when you get infected with them. There we go. So one of the things they do is they shift the balance of these different pathways in the immune, in the immune system. So uh, comes a helminth. And there are different types of helper T cells in the, in the immune system. 
Uh, and broadly, there's this TH1, TH2 paradigm. And um, these TH2 cells are associated with increased production of, of antibodies, and in specifically with increased production of IgE, which is this the immunoglobulin-y particular type of antibody that uh, is thought to bind to the helmets, that's thought to primarily be there to respond to bigger parasites like helmets, things that are bigger than a cell, basically. So it doesn't respond to things like viruses and bacteria. It responds to things like malaria uh, and helmets, uh, mosquito bites. And it's also implicated in, in allergy, particularly in Western countries. Um, it's uh, part of the pathway that is associated with responding sort of inappropriately to, to things in your environment that cause asthma, things like that. So one of the reasons Ig is interesting and helmets are interesting is that there's this hypothesis that lack of exposure to helmets causes dysregulation in this pathway, and that, that this is part of uh, why we see more allergies in, in Western populations. Um, so already we're seeing that there's sort of a trade-off in the shift between this Th1 and Th2 type response. A Th1 response is associated more with with nonspecific defenses like inflammation. Um, and helmets seem to decrease these kinds of pathways too. Uh, another reason helmets are interesting is that, so if we look at, look at IgE response, there's a huge variation geographically. So if we look at, if you read certain textbooks, you'll see something like very low levels of IgE are normal. I've seen statements like this in various immunology textbooks. Because if you look in Western countries, so what this graph is here is IgE level. Um, and this is on a log scale, by the way. So these are pretty large differences between these populations. If you look at uh, North American countries, European countries, you'll see typical levels are sort of under 100 international units per milliliter. But if we look in, in other countries, and some of the highest are in South America, where we have pretty high levels of helmets, you'll see levels up to 10,000 or so um, international units per milliliter. So there's this geographical patterning. And I pointed out here, here's a Schwar. Uh, I put Shimane on here because I'll talk a little, there's a little Shimane data I threw in here. Um, mostly not gonna focus on that, but just so you can see. And then um, down here, this is the NHANES data for the USA, so. Um, so there's this large variation in terms of investment into, into IgE um, that you see geographically. Another thing, helmets have this interesting life cycle where they, you get infected and they don't replicate within your body. Instead, uh, what they'll do is they'll, they'll generate eggs that are uh, excreted in feces. And then this is just showing for a hookworm. It's a little bit different for depending on the species you're talking about. But for hookworm, there's a larval stage that hatches in the soil. And then if you walk around barefoot, you can, they'll, uh, they can get into your body that way. They get in through your feet. Um, or you can ingest them also if you ingest soil. Uh, certain others like uh, roundworm, you have to ingest soil that has the eggs in it and you'll get it. But um, so there's, there's um, as a consequence of this, it's not just like people can get infected and then they keep replicating within them. Their, their burden of helmets is directly related to how much exposure they have in their environment. So this creates this interesting pattern um, in terms of if we look at helmet prevalences in different populations, and at what age individuals are most have the highest burden of helmets, there's a relationship between the overall population prevalence and the age at which prevalence is highest. Um, this is known as the peak shift. So the idea here basically is that, there we go. Um, if you have higher transmission, you have a higher prevalence in your environment, just based on random chance, you're more likely to get exposed at a younger age um, because you're walking around and it's distributed geographically in your environment. Um, and if there's more of it, you're more likely to, to 
to pick it up so at an, at an earlier time. Whereas if there's less of it, it might just take, on average, more time to pick it up. So there's a, there's a um, sort of a clear relationship between using the age at which you first get exposed to helmets as a cue to how likely you are to, get re to be re-exposed later on. Okay, and then the rest of the peak shift is that if you get this earlier age of first infection, it leads to an earlier acquisition of immunity. And that leads to an earlier decline in levels. So you would see, so you see this kind of peak shape here, where if prevalence is higher, you see this sharp peak at earlier ages, and then a decline, that, and the decline comes earlier in these populations as well, because of this earlier acquisition of partial immunity. And I should say, you can't be completely immune to helmets. You, you can presumably get them under control, is what it seems like. There's a little controversy about that. So. So on a population level, prevalences reflect this pattern. And for helmets, age of first infection may be a reliable cue to likelihood of future infection. And this is just showing with hookworm. Um, hookworm intensity in different populations uh, and the age of the peak. And it, there, there's obviously some noise in there, but you see this general sort of pattern where you see an earlier peak when you've got a higher intensity. Okay, and then if we look at IgE, we see a similar sort of pattern. So this is, this is Schwar data uh, with some Shimani data and then and Haynes on here for comparison. And if we look at how, what's going on in terms of investment into IgE or shifting immune function into producing IgE, uh, we see a similar sort of peak shift in terms of this is age down here in years. And then this is IgE on the, uh, on the y-axis here. So, in a, uh, in a U.S. population, this is the, the national survey data, um, we see pretty low levels of IgE. Again, this is on a log scale. Um, and it increases and then it levels off quite a bit. And we see our highest levels around age 17. Um, in the Schwar, we see significantly higher levels of IgE. And we also see that those levels peak out somewhat earlier. But notice it doesn't drop completely still maintains that IgE level. And if we look at the Chimane, the peak's even earlier in terms of Chimane. And they have high, even higher levels of IgE. OK. Um, so the other interesting thing I mentioned about helmets is this shift to this, from this Th1 to Th2 phenotype is that this Th1 phenotype is associated more with inflammatory processes. So the, just, I just mentioned this because another thing I'm going to talk about that we measured is one of these measures of, of inflammation. It's associated with inflammation. And that is C-reactive protein. Um, and C-reactive protein is a, it's a non-specific defense that's produced rapidly when you are infected with something or when there's an injury. Um, and it, it can bind directly to pathogens. But it's used, all, it's used a lot in the literature as a, as a marker of inflammation or a marker of whether you have an active infection at the moment. And CRP, this is Tom McDade's data, um, so he showed here that it was associated with, in two to four year olds, two to four year old Shimane kids with um, poor gain in height. So poor growth, they had higher CRP particularly in those kids that had low energy stores. So suggesting that having low energy stores and you, then you get an infection, it's more likely to impact your growth. Okay. So, okay, so now we get to some actual study information. Um, and what I wanted to test for here was trade-offs between IgE and growth to look at this investment in the, into uh, defense against helmets. Uh, trade-offs between CRP and IgE, because we've got this shifting between this Th2, Th1 phenotype, and trade-offs between CRP and growth. Let's see if we can replicate some of those earlier findings, Tom McDade. Uh, and here are the Schwar. So we did this work with the Schwar of Ecuador. And show you where this is. 
So here's Ecuador. Ecuador is divided into three regions. We've got the coast, Andes run down the middle, uh, and over on this side is the Amazonas region on the east. Um, and Ecuador itself is a little tiny map of South America down here. It's right over here on the, on the uh, west side. And the area where this work is done is right down here in Barona, Santiago. There we go. Uh, I think Clark works right up here. Yeah. Um, primarily down in the Upano Valley. That's where, where this work was done. Can zoom in on that a little bit more. Um, so the Upano, Upano Valley, this is the uh, Upano River, runs down the middle here. This is the Andes over here. So it's the base of the Andes. And then it's on the uh, western side of, this is shorter mountain range called the Kudaku Range. So uh, most of this work was done in a village on the uh, western side of the Kudaku here. But Schwar territory extends over this area and on up. Um, and I won't talk about it a lot right now, but we see, we see differences in terms of integration in the markets and things like that across this territory. So out here there's more hunting, but uh, in here we've got sort of more market integrated populations and things like that. Um, um, I could talk about that a whole lot. Um, so Schwar subsistence, so just to give you a, a feel for, for what it's like and what people are eating. Uh, mostly eating a lot of plantains, a lot of bananas, a lot of manioc. Um, and then with things like fish and game, I mean, in um, the more acculturated places, there's a fair amount of chicken. Uh, there's not a huge amount of protein because some of the hunted games hunted out. Uh, if they happen to be a place on a river, there'll be more fish. And then uh, a lot of chicha, fermented uh, manioc, and various other fruits and stuff. Uh, and this is a rapidly growing population. If you look at the population pyramid for, for uh, the Schwar, something like 53% are under age 15. So that's... Um, Compared to the rest of the world, in the rest of the world, 28% are under age 15. Uh, Latin America as a whole, 30% are under age 15. And for Africa, it's like 41%. So what this basically means is that people are having a lot of kids, and they're not all dying, basically. Now, kids still are dying. Babies are dying, but a lot of them are living. And so the population is rapidly expanding. So women are having their first birth pretty young, uh, median age of about 17, uh, and completed fertility somewhere between 8 and 12 in terms of the number of kids people are having. Okay, um, and looking at the Schwar, there, um, there's a high degree of growth stunting. So this is compared to US standards, um, which may or may not be quite appropriate, but compared to those standards, 40% are classified as being stunted, which is having a low height for your age. Um, and they're more likely to be stunted than some other groups in the region. These uh, individuals called colonos, basically that's just non-indigenous individuals living in the area. And the stunting prevalence for colonos is still fairly high, but it's a lot lower than it is for Schwar. It's about 25%. And then uh, also compared to some Shiviar data we had, uh, Shiviar sort of like Schwar, but less acculturated, living further out to the east. And um, Schwar are more likely to be stunted than them as well. OK. So we took a lot of, did a lot of interviews. This is uh, Melissa Liebert. So I'll point out a few of the other people working on the project here, graduate student at Oregon. Uh, did a lot of measurements of height, grip strength, uh, blood samples. So this is, uh, this is Tiffany Gandolfo and Felicia Madimonos. So um, we collected a bunch of data. I'm not going to talk about a lot of it right now. I'm just going to talk about a few of these data points. But just to um, give you a feel for the kinds of things we collected, we did genealogies and reproductive histories and biomarkers and um, arm circumference, grip strength, hemoglobin, glucose, cholesterol, various other things. 
And what I'm going to talk about today is just data on height, weight, skin folds, BMI. Uh, and we collected um, dried blood spots. So basically, it's just a finger prick. Um, collect blood on a, on a card, uh, let it dry, and then freeze that and transport it back. And it's a reasonably pretty easy way to collect blood samples. Um, it's non-invasive, it doesn't hurt, and it, uh, it's pretty easy to transport, um, pretty, easy, pretty stable too. So, and uh, measured these, used these to measure IgE and CRP using ELISA's. Okay, and then I just want to make a note here about um, <coughs> so testing for trade-offs. Yeah. Was the stunt was it taking into account those or? Both of them, or was it was it only accounting for nutritional differences? The stunting, well, some of it's probably genetic, but okay. yeah, that's just overall what their height was relative to the standard percentiles. So, like, maybe populations would come out as super stunted. They would, yeah, they would, yeah. Um, that's part of why I had the comparison say to the Shiviar. So probably genetically, the genetic differences are going to be kind of small there. Yeah. Uh, I do know from personal experience that schwar in town are a lot bigger. Schwar that are like fully acculturated. Some huge schwar. So I mean, maybe not huge, but relatively huge. Yeah. Um, yeah. OK. So. Um, I'm just going to make a note here about phenotypic correlation. And that is when we're testing for these kinds of energetic trade-offs, life history trade-offs. Uh, part of the problem is that you might find them hard to detect. And the reason for that is that if you've got additional energy, it may come in and it might get funneled into all those pathways. And if you look at that statistically, it might look like you get a positive correlation where you're expecting a negative correlation between things. Um, and it's difficult to control for this. So you could try to um, measure energy inputs, but that's, that's difficult to do. It's time consuming. And you may have accuracy issues if you're trying to measure diet, for example. You can do that. And we did do some food frequency questionnaires. We did some other things to measure um, how wealthy people were. That can sort of be used as a, as a measure of access to resources. and. Um, those kinds of things we put in some of the analyses, and they didn't really have any effect here um, in terms of the wealth variables and things like that. So I'm not really going to talk about the wealth variables. They didn't seem to be a very, very good measure. Instead, uh, skin fold thicknesses as a measure of individuals' fat stores, we use that as a way to control for, for energy status. And this is similar to that uh, atomic date study. I showed some data from earlier where individuals with, you saw a trade off in terms of CRP and growth in individuals with low skin folds, not necessarily in individuals that had lots of energy. And I just um, mentioned this. Most of the graphs I'm going to show, I'm not going to really explicitly talk about the skin folds, but just so you know that I did it. Okay, so in uh, this particular study village, so that earlier uh, sample where we're here pointing out that about 40% were stunted. That was a large multi-village sample. In the study village, we see a fairly comparable sorts of levels of stunting, uh, maybe a little bit higher. It was about 50% in this study village. OK, so um, getting to sort of the meat of it is the, looking at the IgE and CRP in these populations. Um, if we look at what IgE and CRP look like by age, we see totally different patterns for these two types of immune response. Again, IgE is a specific sort of response, uh, CRP as a non-specific sort of response. Uh, this line here, this dark line, that's IgE. And if you remember that earlier graph I showed with the Chimane and the Schwar, it's the same, same picture, where we see an increase in IgE levels with age. This is age down here, goes from about 2.5 to 15, in case the text is a little small. Um, and we see an increase in, in IgE levels, levels off a little, reaches a high point, and then declines a bit. And uh, doesn't, I didn't put on the adults on this graph, but remains kind of around there. Uh, CRP levels are highest earlier on in life, and they decline. 
So just looking at the age pattern, we see that there's sort of an inverse relationship between IgE and CRP just by age. Um, but even if we control for, um, control for this effective age, and we still see there was a negative correlation between IgE and CRP in, in, these, in the children under age 15. Um, but what this is suggesting also, the fact that we have this age pattern, is that in terms of the development of immune function, that we may have different sorts of things going on in terms of over time energy is being shifted into one type of defense and away from another type of defense. And that this may be responding to um, cues in the environment or just the fact that you're infected, basically. OK. OK, and then um, relating this to growth, uh, if we look at how, um, so what I'm doing here is just comparing kids that had standardized residuals for height, that is their, basically their z-scores for height, were uh, either less than one less than negative one or greater than positive one. So these are kids that were pretty low in terms of growth or pretty high in terms of growth. I'm looking at what their, what their IgE levels were. Uh, if we look at younger kids, so I've, I've got kids split into two different age groups here, zero to seven and then eight to 15. If we look at the younger kids, zero to seven, we didn't see much of an effect in terms of differences in IgE levels and growth. But what we do see is if we look at say, the older kids, 8 to 15, there's a significant difference in terms of the, the kids that are smaller have higher IgE levels, and the kids that are, um, that are taller have lower IgE levels at this older age. So we didn't see an effect earlier on. We see it later on. Uh, and that's kind of interesting because it's suggesting that this may be an effect that sort of builds over time, right? If, if maintaining this IgE level kind of continually takes energy, it may take a while to sort of see the effect. Um, and if you run this in another model where you look at effect of, of IgE on height, it works out the same way, where you see this interaction with age, where it, um, you have more of an effect at older ages in terms of this, this trade-off here. And then, interestingly, if we look at CRP, then we look at the differences here. This is not quite significant. It's pretty close. It's significant if you run it in a different model with an uh, interaction term. Um, this is just an easier graph to look at than showing you the, the regression models. Um, you'll see that uh, CRP in the younger kids was higher in, um, in the shorter kids, and CRP was lower in the taller kids. And this is standardized for age, by the way. So. Shorter, shorter for for your age, and taller for your age. And then, interestingly, so this is similar to to what Tom McDade had found in the in the young kids that CRP was was higher in the kids that had poor growth. If we look at the older kids, interestingly, though, we see exactly the opposite effect, where CRP is actually associated with better growth at older ages. And you'll notice this is opposite the effect here of IgE. Um, so well, what does this mean? So what do we know here? We know that CRP is highest in early childhood. IgE is highest during later childhood. CRP is associated with poorer growth early on in development, but better growth later in childhood. IgE is associated with poorer growth later in life. Okay, so how would we interpret this? Well, one possible interpretation, and um, we should um, say that you know there are some caveats on this, and that is one that we don't know for sure that all these kids were exposed to the same things. It could be there could be cohort effects or something. It's not we didn't follow the same kids over many years, so it's cross-sectional data. But one possible interpretation is that if you have early pathogenic insults and specifically early infection with helminths. Um, well, early on you're not going to have specific sorts of defenses to that. You haven't developed them yet. So you might respond with a generic sort of response like inflammation, a CRP type response. And that might shift energy though into developing those kinds of specific defenses that you might want. Because you've been exposed early on, 
you might want to invest in having, that might be a cue that you're going to likely to be exposed repeatedly later on in your life. You might want to invest energy into standing defenses to defend against that later on. So that might shift energy into specific humoral responses, IG in this case, and away from growth, because something, the energy has to come from somewhere. So that would mean, though, that children who have high CRP early in childhood are probably the same kids that are going to have lower CRP and higher, lower growth and higher IgE as they get older. And that children who do not tune their immune systems early on should rely on more generic responses later on. So if you have never developed these specific responses, you get infected later in life, your only recourse might be to use these more generic responses because you haven't invested in the specific sorts of responses. Okay, so uh, one way to test this a little bit further is to look at adults in the same population. So if, if we really have this sort of uh, tuning of different pathways, directing of energy, then we would expect this possibly to persist into adulthood. So we might predict that taller adults would rely more on generic immune responses like inflammation, which is not to say that inflammation isn't costly, it just is to say that those are individuals that haven't invested in this specific defense over time. And that shorter adults would have immune systems more tuned to, to the particular insults that are particular in that environment, in this case, helmets, most likely. So a small sample from the same village. And I just want to point out that uh, these people are all related in this village. Mean coefficient of relatedness is just a little bit less than second cousins. So we, we might say that they, in terms of the importance of genetics in determining height, it's going to be less than you would be if you had a really diverse sort of population. So most of this is going to be environmental. And because of that, I think, when we looked at IgE, CRP, and adult height, uh, IgE actually accounted for 26% of the variance in adult height, which is a huge amount, actually, in terms of when you think about something like height, and you think about, you know, this would never work if we did it in this room or something, because people have such different genetic backgrounds and things like that. But it looked like it worked here. Um, CRP was, had the opposite sort of effect, not as strong as IgE. Uh, if we look at weight, same sort of thing. IgE accounting for 25% of the variance in adult height, or in adult weight. Um, and CRP actually accounting for a little bit more here, but uh, the fact is when you control for fat stores, CRP is, so CRP in Western populations is also known to be associated with uh, heavier BMI, having, having more fat in your body. Um, and there's this association in Western populations between uh, having fat and having more inflammation. And um, it seems to be kind of the same thing here, where most of the effect of CRP uh, was actually associated with fat stores <coughs> in individuals. But the effect of IG is independent of fat stores in terms of uh, adult height and adult weight. So the adult data supported the hypothesis that we had some kind of developmental tuning that was persisting um, and, and affecting early on affecting trade-offs between specific community, non-specific community, and growth, and that these are persisting in some way into adulthood. And um, maybe more importantly, from a public health perspective, this is suggesting this association with IgE that helmets, even though they look like they're not doing a lot, they may have hidden costs that sort of add up over time. Um, Another hidden cost of helmets that I just mentioned briefly may be that due to this shifting in immune function, uh, individuals seem to have, that are infected with helmets, seem to have poorer response to vaccines because the Th1 sort of response is going to respond to sorts of things like viruses and uh, bacteria that you might get a, a vaccine for. And so it may make individuals more susceptible to, may have, may have poorer response to vaccines and possibly more susceptibility to, to other diseases as a consequence. But probably no allergies, so. <laughs> um, okay. Um, so I'm just going to talk briefly about one other thing we looked at here, and that was um, the effect of, of family members on, on these sorts of allocations. So looking at how, um, if parents have lots of kids, is that affecting 
energy availability. If our parents facing basically a quantity quality trade-off in terms of how many offspring they produce and how much they can invest in each. So basically the way um, we looked at this was just to look at um, the effect family members were having, controlling for the effect of other family members on the height, IgE, CRP, of, um, of kids in the household. Okay, so um, this, this is showing family member effects on height. I'll have to explain what this graph is because it's a little complicated. Um, on, on this side here on the left, these are male family members and these are female family members on the right and they're having effects on a kid that's in the household and so this is the age of an individual in the household and this is a child age over here on the y-axis um, and then this graph up here uh, is basically this graph flipped on its side so it's like a cross section through the middle of the graph so you can see the confidence intervals around the around the fit um, and blue is showing a negative effect. So basically, if we look over here, the first part, these so are male family members. Male family members under age 10, that's this blue section right here, are having a negative effect on the height of other children within that household. So basically, the more, the more of those you have in the household, the poorer the, the height of, of kids in the household on average, essentially, is the way this works out. Um, and the same thing over here with more female kids. And you can see it up here, too. If you look, this is below this zero line. So that's suggesting a negative effect on height of having more kids under age 10 in the same household. That's Yeah, so. Um, what, what measure are you using for confidence intervals? Is it 5% on each side? Yeah, so it's the 95% confidence intervals. Yeah. Uh, yes, yeah. Okay, so this is the first part that we do have evidence that having more kids in the, in the household, in this model anyway, um, is having a negative effect on, on height. And then there's some interesting things going on here. I'll just point out a couple of them. Um, this uh, males age about 10 to 25 or so, having a positive effect on height. This is the same thing uh, Ed Hagen did a study. I think you, you were on that one? Yeah. Where he found that the adolescent males were having a positive effect. So that's the same thing. Uh, and the other big effect is from these females. Females around age 40, a little bit younger, having a positive effect on height. And I'm not going to show the weight graph. It looks pretty much the same. Um, but then there's this other interesting thing, and you'll notice we have really wide confidence intervals when we try to look at the effects of old people. So look at grandmothers and things like that. Because um, the sample's not that big. There are tons and tons of kids. There aren't that many old people. So it's hard to measure the effects of the old people. Um, but it is interesting to note that the older women over here look like they're having a negative effect. That's the way that fell out. And this is largely flat, actually. You look at the line up here. So I don't, I don't want to draw too much from that because it's not significant. But yeah. And is, um, this, the other blue on the male graph actually also looks like the period of peak, produ peak production. For right here. For the males here? Yeah. Well, it looks like they're having a negative, negative effect, effect, right? That's what I mean. so, so it's just like the grandma should be opposite of what. Yeah, that's a little odd. Um, and um, here, let me show this next, actually, because. Do you have to be in the same household? Yeah, this is all in the same household. So the way, well, the way this works is it solves for one age fit, which is the spine that you see. Um, taking into account, it's basically a matrix of everybody in the household and their ages, and it uses that to regress on, regresses on that. So With, and yeah, it's not, uh, yeah, it's not taking into account what the actual relationship is, it's just the age of the person in the household. Yeah. If you can figure out a way to put relatedness in it, so then you need way more data. Yeah. 
affects a different household and a single household with 12 with each other? What's that? So when you're calculating the interval estimates, you need to know what the variance the estimator is. And so you have, say, three brothers or three sibs in the same family. They're experiencing the same number of other people, but also this random shock, presumably, that, that they're getting is at least correlated, right? So, you know, they live in a bad, the garden's bad where they live, or some other thing is bad. Right, right, right. Uh, and maybe you don't want to talk about this, but it's just a hard problem. Uh, well, you can put household in there and do it as a mixed effects model so that individuals within the same household are correlated. Um, on this model, I don't think I did that because we had something like 50 family. Oh, it was like 100 kids from 50 families or something, and they were spread out pretty evenly. And um, it wasn't a huge sample, so I didn't, I didn't control for that in this particular analysis. But we did it as a mixed effects model, I think. You could you could put that in to control for that correlation. Yeah. Uh, I already clicked through that. Okay, so yeah, we thought it was weird that these males here look like they're having a negative effect. So this is actually um, this is just accelerometry data. So we had people wear accelerometers to measure how much how many calories they were expending in activity during the day, basically. And uh, these guys, even though they look like they're having a negative effect, they're these guys right here, the green triangles. They're working pretty hard, so they're, they're doing something. It's not just that they're sitting around. Um, but that's, that's what we had right now. I haven't followed them around yet to see exactly how this works, so it takes longer. And it, what, I, what I think it might be is that we also looked at those guys and that those guys in that range tend to have wives that are pregnant or lactating. So it may be the fact that even though they're working hard, all that extra energy is going into producing more children. And the fact that more children are being produced is having a net negative effect on, on the kids in the household. But that, that's just an idea. Um, we do see that men in, in households where the wife's pregnant or lactating are working a lot harder than, than other men and working harder than the pregnant women themselves. Um, another thing I want to point out, I ran this same kind of model across a multi-village sample. And these are villages at different distances from the main road. Um, and this is just for females, actually. Didn't have the the only the female part came out significant in, uh, in this particular model. Um, so this is the age of female in a household, and this is distance to the main road. And um, you can see that, so this is just height right here in distance to the main road. Height was lowest in these sort of intermediate villages that are not super close to the main road, but they're a little ways away. Um, but they're not the farthest away. And what we think is going on is that those villages kind of get the worst of both, both worlds. They're not close enough to really get the benefits of, of access to markets, but they have crappy hunting, so they're not, um, whereas the, the villages that are further away probably have better hunting and things like that. But if, if we run this and look at the effects of individuals in the household across this sort of sample, we do see variance there too. Uh, and women are having, these older women are having this positive effect really in the, the more distant villages and in the more acculturated villages. We see this interesting effect of of teenage girls, but but not as much from the older women. So that might be that opportunities basically for for investment are changing, and and who can invest is changing. And girls are sticking around in the household longer here too. So there may be more teenage girls around that can alloparent. Okay. And then one last thing, and that's the family member effects then on IgE and CRP. And this is why I wanted to sort of throw this in at the end of the talk here. Um, if we look at um, family member, this family member age here, and for this, didn't have enough statistical <coughs> power to separate out males and females, so it's just family member age in general, overall. And this is effect on IgE, an effect on CRP. Um, and what we see, first off, these same uh, kids, there we go, that are having uh, negative effect on um, growth 
are also in having a positive effect on the IgE of other kids in the household. So sort of makes sense if you would expect that you, you have more kids around, you're more likely to spread helmets around and you know have feces on the floor and step on it. Um, yeah. um, but we see a couple of interesting things here, and you see this effect here that that's not not huge, may not be significant in terms of decreasing IgE of having more more um, adults, about 20 to 50 in the household. The interesting thing for me, I think, is that we see that older people in the household are really having this positive effect on IgE of other individuals in the household. And I don't have direct Schwar data to look at this, but I do have some Chimane data. And if we look at um, prevalence, this is likelihood of being infected. These are basically odds ratios of being infected with these different helmets at different ages. Um, hookworm, anyway, we see a lot more infection in older individuals. And down here, this is any, any helmet at all. This is hookworm. This is a uh, roundworm. This is a uh, threadworm and whipworm. Um, these two are not very common in Chimane. These two are pretty common. And if we look at any helmet at all, we see higher, higher, higher likelihood of being infected with these at older ages, too. So that's suggesting to me that, that both kids and older adults are probably maybe disease vectors in terms of spreading us in the household. And that's, that's something to think about when thinking about effects of family members on other family members. Do you have a sense for whether that's because of immunological senescence or because there's a cohort effect where old adults are traditional and they don't wear rubber boots and um, so they're more likely to get infected, so they're more likely to be vectors? Yeah, um, probably both, although I don't know for sure. Yeah, we do have some data on whether people were wearing shoes when they came to the interview and things like that. I haven't analyzed that yet, though. Um, but we also know that lymphocyte counts go down, and um, so which one's causing it? I'm, yeah, I don't know. It could be that they are less resistant to if they had poor conditions growing up or something like that, too. Uh, it could be that kind of cohort effect. Yeah. Um, okay, so just to sum up, uh, additional children increase IG but decrease growth. Males 15 to 25 contribute to growth. Uh, 25 to 35 have negative effects on growth despite high activity levels. Adults 35 to 50 increase growth, especially females in CRP. And adults over 50 were increasing IgE. Um, so here's our general sort of trade-off model. We've got energy, and it could go into weight, or it could go into uh, IgE, or it could go into height. And I put uh, the trade-off here oh, because um, mostly IgE looked like it had more of an effect on height than it did on weight in this particular sample. Um, so typically, we think of adults probably as producing, contributing to this energy store and kids using up this energy store. Um, and then adults in their reproductive range may be doing a variety of things. Uh, if they're younger, maybe alloparenting uh, and producing. And, and we have these older adults, the males, for example, also uh, producing, looking like they're working pretty hard. But it might be that they're producing more children also, and that's offsetting it. But then what I really just want to add into this sort of model of family member effects and out parenting is this idea of pathogen exposure and how different family members and family composition might be affecting pathogen exposure and that affecting height and these kinds of outcomes. It's fitness proxies. So we might suspect that children are increasing pathogen exposure, having more kids in the household, especially if you're living in a crowded environment or something like that. Um, we can imagine, anyway, that adults might be having negative effects on that through high, things like hygiene, for example, or bathing of kids, grooming. And then older adults possibly increasing this pathogen transmission as well, either for whatever reason. Yeah. And I'll leave it there. Yeah.